بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله سبحانه وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون All praise is due to Allah, we praise Him, seek for His assistance and forgiveness, and we seek refuge with Him from the evils of our souls and our misdeeds. No one can mislead whosoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, and no one can be guided whosoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes to go astray. I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone, and He has no partner. I also testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is His slave and the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all those who followed him and will follow him in righteousness till the day of judgment. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasrili amri wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to start off this khutbah by saying one thing. Congratulations on getting it to the end of the year. We all know that it's been a struggling 15 weeks, and this is the first time, uh, one of the, I think, second year or third year, in which the full month of Ramadan is happening during our college semester. In which we have to force, both face the difficulties of fasting, waking up early, staying up late, but making sure you get your studies done. You're awake for ADM class. And I do want to remind you that we still have one more week left. We still have finals left. And it's a reminder to finish strong. We should always both try our best, but also have to work in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This duality, this duality of both having trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you know that at the, at the end of the day, the result is in Allah's hand, but also making sure you tie your camel, making sure you do your due diligence, making sure you put your efforts in. And it's just a reminder for all of us to take that with us to the end of the week, and inshallah take that also as a way to live our lives in, in later on. To both put your effort in, and to welcome Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's now, I want to shift your attention to the very fact that's nearing the end of the semester. Some of us might be graduating, like for me. Maybe we're starting an internship. Maybe we're going overseas. Maybe we're staying with family. Maybe we're working, or continuing our studies, etc. And it's amazing to see and it's always fun to anticipate what's coming in the year after, what's coming after. You're always looking forward to what's next. The new stage in life. What's happening to me over there? What's going to happen to me when I move from this certain community, from this certain area, from this certain experiences that I've been the same, the same ones, and then moving to a different place. Moving to a different area, a different community, a different way of action. For example, when you're in college, it's very different when you're in work when you're at home, or when you go overseas, wherever you may be going. It's different. Different mindset, different daily rhythm. But I want to ask one question. And I want to pose this to everyone. What's something that doesn't change no matter where we transition in life? What's something that we have to carry close to our hearts no matter where we go or where we might be? The answer is, of many, but honestly, I think it's the most important answer. It's our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's that covenant? It's the promise that we made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's the shahada. The same shahada that we say at the very least five or six times a day. Even more. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And there's no prophet, and the last message is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is our covenant, our promise of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's what made us Muslim. That's the promise we made to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and say, hey, if and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told us that if you follow this, if you follow this promise with me, this covenant, 
I will guarantee you what? Jannah. I will guarantee you paradise in the hereafter. So what do we get in return? Jannah. And what do we get to avoid as well? Jahannam. Hell. How brave a blessing is that? Just by dedicating our time for let's say on a good side 80 plus years right of our time. I can get a life of eternal pleasure and I can avoid a life of full torment. Here's an example to bring this into context. And you've probably seen this example actually being used in social media. But really it is something to think about. We were all fasting just a couple weeks ago. A couple like, what, two weeks ago? Last week? We were fasting. And we were extremely parched. But when we had our first sip of water, what? We forgot about that feeling of thirst. And we did the end of hunger. As soon as you had your first bite, you forgot about that hunger. Very quickly. Give it like five, ten minutes, you forget that you're even fasting a day. So now imagine the way that we feel when we've lived a difficult life. And we feel like we've had nothing but hardship in this life. But when we experience Jannah for a little bit, we'll quickly, quickly forget about these hardships. Imagine that. One dip in Jannah. And guess what? There's a hadith that talks about this. Anas ibn Malik reported that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one amongst the denizens of hell who had led a life of ease and plenty amongst the people of the world would be made to dip in fire only once on the day of resurrection. And then it would be said to him, O son of Adam, did you find any comfort? Did you happen to get any material blessing? And he would say, By Allah, no, my Lord. And then that person, from amongst the person in the world to be brought, who had led the most miserable life in this world, from amongst the inmates of paradise, and who would be made to dip once in paradise. And it would be said to him, O son of Adam, did you face any hardship? Or had any distress fall on you? And he would say, By Allah, no, my Lord, never did I face any hardship or experience any distress. That's what we're, that's what we're looking after. That's what we want to achieve. And that's what the power of the Shahada holds. Our covenant, our promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks from us is to make true to this promise. And you'll be guaranteed eternal heaven. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even have to bother even thinking of giving us this heaven? Is He dependent upon us? No, He's not. But He's offering this immense blessing for us. So now I keep talking about the covenant, talking about the shahada. But what does that entail? What does that mean? It has to just, not just saying the shahadah, that's it. No, there's more to it. A Muslim is a person that always remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And is a person who thinks whether his next action is haram or halal, is it pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. We live in a society where the laws and social standards around us are, decide, are decided by what? Our desires. And I don't need to bring examples. But what? We see it day after day. It's getting worse and worse. You start thinking to yourself, where's this ever going to end? How far can our desires take us? So how far are we going to keep digging this hole? How far? And guess what? We see people compromising their deen. Falling for the deception, deceptions they play, place for us. But what? We must always remember to follow the Quran Sunnah. Make that our guiding light. Not what we see in social media, in the society around us. Not what we see the people doing around us, but rather always go to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked. The very first part of the shahada is say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there's no deity worthy worship of Allah. What does that worship entail? It entails obedience. Since I know Allah is the one who created everything. I know Allah is the most just. I know Allah is the most wise. I know Allah is not biased. So I know that the rules that He gives me, what He tells me to follow, must be the truth no matter what. No doubt in my heart at all whatsoever. That's what it means to take Allah as the one and only Creator. That's what it means to stay true to that covenant. We made a contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
when we said the shahada. And it's our duty to fulfill this contract. أقول قولي هذا وصف الله إليكم سلام سمي فاستغفروه إن الغفور الرحيم عباد الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم in the name of Allah, all oh, praise be to Allah, and blessings and peace be upon the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let me tell you a story. A story about a sahabi called Rabi' bin Amr. Actually, let me rephrase that a little bit. I want to tell you about a past historical event about a man named Rabi' bin Amr. We oftentimes forget that these incidents of the sahaba, of the messengers, aren't just stories, but rather they're historical events that happened. And we should look back at them and learn from them. So let me set the scene. So at the head of the Persian army was a man named Rustam. And he marched against Qadasiyya and he encamped the east bank of Atiq. The Muslim forces were there in Qadasiyya on the west bank of Atiq. And Rustam was the commander-in-chief of the Persian forces. And he sent a message to the Muslim commander, Sa'ad, asking him to send what? An emissary for talks. So Sa'ad sent Rabi' bin Amir as the envoy, as the emissary. Rabi' Rabi crossed that bridge and made for the camp of Rustam, that Persian general, that Persian commander-in-chief. The Persian army was the strongest at that time. Anyone would fear going to them alone, especially in the context of battle. So when he made for that camp, he was wearing a coat of shining mail over which he was wrapped a coarse woolen cloak. Around his head was a veil held by thongs of a camel's girth and his sword hung at his side in a sheath of coarse cloth. In his right hand, he carried a spear and Rabi' bin Amr mounted on a shaggy horse arrived at the edge of the carpet on which Rustam and his courtiers were seated. What to understand from this is that Rabi bin Amr wasn't dressed in the most amazing of clothes. He was very humble. To the point, and that's it. And he showed up in what? In his horse, shaggy horse, meaning like it wasn't very strong, it wasn't very appealing. And guess what? He showed up to the carpet of the commander of chief of one of the strongest armies at that time. The Persians wanted, obviously, this seems like disrespect to them in their eyes, the Persians. And they're saying they wanted Rabi to lay aside his arms. Lay aside these weapons, push away this force, all this nonsense. You're coming before the king. He's a much higher level, commander in chief, he's much higher level than you. And Rabi said, I have not come to you to lay down my weapons. You invited me, and I have come. If you do not wish me to come the way I like, I shall return. So Rustam asked his men, to let the Muslims come, the Muslim come in the way he wished. So the Rustam asked Rabi bin Amr as to what was their mission? Why are they trying to engage in battle? When the Rustam, the king of Persia, asked the Muslims, Why did you come to Persia? Rabi bin Amr said, And I really want you guys to focus on this. This is really the most important part. Rabi bin Amr said, Allah Azza wa Jal has sent us to deliver you from worshiping the creation to worship in the creator of the creation and to deliver you from the constriction of this world to the vastness of this world and the hereafter. And from the oppression of the religions to the justice of Islam, Allah Azza wa has sent us to save you from worshiping each other. And Rabi' said that their mission was to spread Islam. And he said, if you accept Islam, we are brothers and there is peace between us. If you refuse, we fight you and we lead things to Allah. And Rustam asked, what do you expect in return? And Rabi Amr said, victory if we survive, and paradise if we die fighting in the way of Allah. Rustam said that he should be allowed some time to think over the matter. And then Rabi responded, according to the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would give him a time of three days. And listen to this part as well. Rustam asked Rabi Amr, because he saw Rabi bin Hamid with confidence 
did not hesitate at all, did not fear the commander in chief at all. So who you would think this person? This person is of high caliber, of high status. And guess what Rustam asked him? Rustam asked him, are you their chief? Are you the leader of these Muslims? And Rabbi bin Amr said, no. But the Muslims are like one body. And the lowest is equal to the highest. That's the way Rabbi bin Amr carried himself. No hesitation. No doubt. Didn't stutter one bit. Full of confidence. Knowing that he's carrying the truth. And he's staying true to his what? To the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the face of the biggest difficulty he'll probably face in his life. And subhanallah, there's genuinely so much to unpack from the story. But I want to comment again on the character of Rabbi bin Amr. Even in front of one of the strongest armies and leaders of the world, he didn't back down and turn away. From his what? From his Allah, which is Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. If Allah demands me to speak the truth, I will speak the truth. I will not this mix my message. I will not compromise on what I say. I will not fear someone that has been created by Allah. I will say it the way it is, the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants me to say it, because that's saying true to my promise with Allah. That's saying true to the truth. Did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ever, ever, change his message? No. And if he did change his message, would that be justice? No, it wouldn't. That's why he never did. And that's why whatever whatever the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, we take as what. As sunnah, we take that as part of our laws and actions we follow, right? Because we know he never deviated. And that's the right way. Never deviated. And now imagine ourselves in that very same situation. What would our reaction be? What would our initial thoughts be? Imagine you standing in person of the highest superpowers of that time. And clearly you know he'll be angry if you tell him, what you're worshiping is not right. What you're living your life is not right. I'm going to change you from the bottom up. I'm going to, I want you to become a Muslim. Imagine you go and tell that someone of the highest caliber, of the highest levels. Personally, the first thing, I'll be shaking in my boots, genuinely. But no. Rabbi Ibn Ahmed stayed true to his covenant, true to his promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And continue without hesitation. And now another part I want to focus in Rabbi Ibn Ahmed's story is when he said we deliver you from worshiping the creation to worshiping the creator of the creation what does that mean there's a hadith again that explains to us very easily Adi bin Hatim radiallahu anhu said that he came to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wearing a gold cross around his neck and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said oh Adi throw away this idol from yourself and then the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the verse they, the Jews and Christians, took the rabbi and the monks to be their lords beside Allah. And it's from Surah Tawbah, Ayah 31. And then, obviously, the first thing that comes to your mind is that, well, that's not true. Jews and Christians don't take their rabbis and monks as their lords. That's not, they just take them as a guidance, not lords. But then the Prophet Muhammad elaborated on the ayah. And he said, it was not that they worshipped these people, but rather whatever they made permissible for them, they believed it to be permissible. And whatever they forbade, they believed it to be unlawful. That's what it means to worship. When we, that's what it means to take someone as your Rabb. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. I take no one, no one is worthy of worship except Allah. No one is, there's only one Lord and that's Allah. What does that mean? That whatever we take as lawful and good, we take it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever He says. And whatever we take as bad, we want to avoid and make sure we stay away from it as far as possible. We take that from who? Again, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is the one and only Lord. That's what it means to worship. That's what it means to say true to the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rabbi delivered on his promise to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in his oath in covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we must take note that the rules and regulations that we follow and apply in our lives must be based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Nowadays, we don't understand our responsibility. It's tough to understand our role and responsibility in life as Muslims. But Rabbi ibn Amr's actions were a representative of Islam. And when he was asked about what he had come to do and what Islam is, he 
he responded, what? Beautifully and full of confidence. And we must reach that same level where all our actions are based on Islam. We become proud of our Islamic identity and represent it correctly for the world to see and learn. Brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity, to, we have the opportunity to commit our life to the goal we were created for. I created the jinn and humans for nothing else but they worship me. We live in a time when Islam is misrepresented, misunderstood by many, including what? For and foremost, ourselves. We have to be like the Sahaba and commit our life to the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to understand our deen and apply it fully in our lives. It's the only way of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted for us. And we will stay true to our covenant, our shahada that way. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اليوم وكنت لكم دينكم وكنت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا This day, I have perfected for you your religion and have bestowed upon you my bounty in full measure and have been pleased to assign for you Islam as your religion, a way of life. So brothers and sisters, let's understand our deen the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand it. Go and read the Quran. Understand its meaning and verses and rules. Read the, read the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and understand it and apply it in our life and know your role to carry to the people, both Muslims and non-Muslims, without deviation from his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa path and without compromise. That's the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never compromised. And like I said in the very beginning of the khutbah, no matter where we may go or end up in our, in our life, one thing that stays true is that we have to hold our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will remain constant. And we must make sure that we stay true to that covenant throughout our whole life to achieve the greatest reward in the hereafter, which is Jannah. اللهم صلي على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع مجيب الدعوات أو الله We seek your favor to let our hearts be full of your gratitude and keep our tongue moist with your remembrance O oh Allah, guide us to know what is good, make us benefit from what we have learned, and increase our knowledge. O oh Allah, give us in this world that which is good, and in the hereafter which is much better, and save us from the torment of the fire. O oh Allah, provide protection to our brothers and sisters and our children in the Sham, Palestine, Yemen, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Burma, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, and other parts of the world. O oh Allah, keep us and them on a the straight path, and fill their hearts with patience and tranquility. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. ربنا ألا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين عباد الله إن الله يمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يسجب لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أعلى وعز وجل وتم وهم وأكبر وأقم الصلاة <تصفيق>